St. Patrick is not impressed with your Irishness. I'm Simon Rafe, and I'm taking the hard line. Welcome back to Hardline, the show where if I only upset half of you, I failed as a presenter. I'm your host, Simon Rafe, and joining me later will be my producer, Joseph Enders, a man so based and red-pilled, he is literally invisible to liberal boomers. After that, our Rome correspondent, Jules Gomes, and I will be having a gentleman's chat about all the goings-on in the church, in the Vatican, and in whatever bits of the world Jules receives intelligence from. And that is a lot of the world, because Jules is not only a man of taste and discretion, but has many ears to the ground. Jules actually only has two ears. He is not some many-eared freak. That is a metaphor. But for now, St. Patrick's Day, March the 17th. If you are watching this the week it aired, and if not, why not? It's a weekly show. Watch it when it comes out. Don't be binging six episodes at once like some kind of Dorito crumbed slovenly heap on your sofa. Daily bread and all that. If you are watching this episode the week it came out, St. Patrick's Day is this Friday coming. It is a Friday in Lent. St. Patrick's Day is always in Lent, but it's not always on Friday. One time in seven it is, and that's the hard line I want to take first. The rule, and it is a rule, the rule for minimum Lenten observance of the Catholic Church is abstaining from flesh meat, that is beef and chicken and lamb and pork and quail and venison and pretty much any animal corpse that isn't a fish. Yes, yes, I said animal corpse. The world runs on death. Get used to it or you'll never be saved. The minimum rule for Lenten observance is abstaining from meat on all Fridays of Lent unless, and this is where people bend the hard line or just go crashing through it with a big old shamrock green bulldozer, the minimum rule is abstaining from meat on all Fridays unless the Friday falls on a solemnity. Not a feast, not a memorial, not your birthday or a party or the one day you can get off work and you are going to go to that new barbecue joint. St. Patrick's Day always falls in Lent, always. And it's not a universal solemnity. There are two universal solemnities which generally fall in Lent, Annunciation or Lady Day and St. Joseph. You will notice neither of those is St. Patrick's Day and it never will be. So if St. Patrick's Day falls on a Friday in Lent, as it did in 2017, and as it does in 2023, if St. Patrick's Day falls on a Friday, you can't eat meat. You can't have corned beef and cabbage. You can't have bacon on your potatoes. You can't have Irish bangers with your breakfast. Now, in some dioceses, there is an allowance flat for Fridays outside Lent. You can replace abstaining from meat with some other penance, but there is no such allowance within Lent, none. Now, of course, there are those of you who are saying, ah, perhaps with a varying degree of Irish brogue, ah, you are saying, oh, you have a special dispensation. And yes, you very well might. First off, if your parish is St. Patrick's, then St. Patrick's Day is a solemnity for you. That is the universal rule for the title of the individual church. So if you are a parishioner at St. Mary Magdalene, the feast of July 22nd is a solemnity for you. If you are a parishioner at the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin, then sorry, you struck out. It's already a solemnity. And if you are in a particular diocese, the local ordinary may grant permission for his flock to eat meat on St. Patrick's Day if it falls on a Friday. I believe New York does that. That is well within his rights and purview and something he can absolutely do. It's also well within his rights and purview to say that a holy day of obligation that falls on a Monday gets transferred to Sunday so people don't need to go to Mass so often. It's within his right and purview to close parishes, to suppress certain expressions of the liturgy, to dismiss or sideline or evoke the faculties of priests who have crossed him. He has the right. That doesn't make it right. And that's the hard line here. Well, first off, there is the first hard line that you don't get to eat meat on a Friday in Lent. I'm not going to belabor that point because I am not a fish and this is not Armani. Have you noticed? The holy mackerel wears Armani. That is not a joke. There are no jokes to be made. The fish who slaps burgers out of people's hands while parodying every pop culture property for the last 70 years does so while wearing an Armani jacket. People, stop throwing things in the sea, okay? He finds them and he uses them and just, 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 just stop. Absent a dispensation, you don't eat meat on a Friday in Lent. There is no debate, there is no discussion, it is not open to interpretation. There are no alternative penances, there is no excuse. 
If you eat meat on a Friday in Lent, you are breaking the church's commandments, which are, because the church is his mystical body with the power to bind and loose, Christ's commandments. If you do it deliberately, you are doing so deliberately. Very simple, very basic. Even a fish understands it. That aside, although I'm sure I'm going to upset people by simply stating the church laws, that aside, the hard line is this. Why are you seeking to have your faith made easier rather than seeking to be made stronger to carry this teeny, tiny little cross of no corned beef on St. Paddy's Day? To expand the point to the other things the bishop can dispense one from, the holy day of obligation that falls on a Saturday or a Monday, Ascension Sunday, as it has come to be known, moving the observance of the Ascension from the scriptural and historical day of Thursday to the following Sunday. There are two possibilities here. We react badly, angrily to those. We get het up and upset and bristle at the softening of our faith, the dumbing down, the removing of the visible signs of our piety, the concrete expressions of our devotion. We react badly to that, but do we embrace and seek out the option to eat meat on a Friday? Are our carnivore tendencies so great we become the very thing we, that is us, you and I, and by you and I, I mean the people watching right now, do we become the very thing we decry and reject as inauthentically Catholic? A soft liberal without firm devotion and adherence to the penitence of the church? Someone who rejects the cross but embraces the banquet? That is one possibility. The other is even worse. Do we embrace, not accept, because the bishop has such authority. Do we embrace this weakening, this softening, this easing of the faith? We have to accept it. He is the lawgiver. That is his law, even if it is a dumb law. But because it is a dumb law, we don't have to embrace it. The law isn't you have to eat corned beef and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day. The law isn't you cannot attend Mass on the Monday when I've moved the holy day to Sunday. The law is you may and you should choose not to. All of these dispensations, these softenings, these easings of requirements, little tiny requirements, not even really crosses, barely a splinter from the cross in your shoulder. All of these softenings make the faith easier, but the faith wasn't made to be easy. The faith was made to be two things. Remember these two things and you won't go far wrong. It was made to be both the hardest, most expensive thing you would ever do, ever purchase. It demands everything you have and requires every ounce of strength you possess. In fact, in truth, the faith needs more than that. The faith requires strength you don't have and demands a price you can't pay. The only way you can meet the faith demands is by becoming stronger and richer from the treasuries of heaven itself. The faith was made to be the most expensive thing you will ever buy, but it was also made to be the best deal you would ever get. From absolutely everything you have and are, you get heaven. Great deal. Best deal. Trust me. All of these softenings, the moving of masses and the removal of penitential devotions like ember days and rogation days and vigils, but also embracing dispensations for Lenten abstinence or a pharisaical adherence to exactly when the fast is over, or a technical abstinence from meat that is actually a gorging on seafood and the cheese platter. All of these softenings make the faith easier, and that is a perfect satanic seduction. Because we think the faith should become easier, right? As we get better at it, I must be doing something right if this is easy. Well, yes. If the faith were a job or a task or something, if it were public speaking or carpentry or driving or or any number of things. But it's not. It's akin to weightlifting, meaning that once you can bench 100 pounds, you put another 10 on the bar. It's like running. Once you can do a mile, you go for two. God will keep upping the ante, making it harder and harder, but he will do it as you get stronger and stronger. So it is never easier, but instead you are doing better. But Satan can trick us. I'm doing so well, we think. I keep to what I have to keep to. I go to mass when I have to. I fast and abstain when I have to. I say the prayers I have to. Have to. No, no, you're looking at it wrong. It's not what do I have to do for God for my salvation. It's what I can do for God for my salvation. What should I do? What should you do? More. So many people today celebrate St. Patrick's Day as a kind of 
Irish festival. Even non-Catholics, atheists do that. Corn beef and cabbage and green beer and kiss me I'm Irish t-shirts. I mean, there's a hard line there. You shouldn't be celebrating a Catholic saint with drunkenness and debauchery, and we shouldn't let the culture take our heritage and file the edges off and turn it into a commercialized bacchanalia. Joe, Joe, write that one down. That's a whole nother hard line. If you want to celebrate St. Patrick's Day because you're Irish or an emigre, or you like to pretend you are, or you just admire them, great, do that. But celebrate it like St. Patrick, like the Catholic Irish would want you to. Patrick was an evangelist, one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever seen. He was taken as a slave to Ireland. He escaped captivity and returned to Ireland in order to evangelize. He could have taken the easy route, stayed in Britain, not gone back to the land of druids and human sacrifice and danger. But he didn't. He did the hard thing, the expensive thing, the thing that got him the best deal. He went to a land of druids and sorcery and human sacrifice and turned that pagan land into the land of saints and scholars, turned the people into not only loyal sons of the church, but strong sons of the church. When their harvest failed and they suffered persecution, they struck out and found a place in the new world to practice their faith. That, of course, is why we have corned beef and cabbage. It's not an Irish dish. It's a New York Irish diaspora dish. The Irish came to New York and they were hated and they were persecuted. And they were driven into the ghettos where all the butchers were Jewish. And so they couldn't get their pork and bacon because Jewish. So they started with corned beef, a poor man's cut in a poor man's ghetto, suffering and striving and living a hard life, but always loyal to the faith. If you want to celebrate St. Patrick, if you want to celebrate Irishness, that's the way to do it. Step up, sacrifice, do the hard thing, the expensive thing. Embrace not the softenings of excuses, the mediocrity of ease. Embrace the reality that St. Patrick's falls in Lent and sometimes it's on a Friday and sometimes you just have to grab the shillelagh and beat the devil out of some snakes. The snakes are your sins, your weaknesses, your willingness to embrace softness and comfort and ease. You were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness and only through suffering and sacrifice can you gain it. Go the extra mile. You'll find the road will rise to meet you. So what do you think, Joe? No, I, I, I really like how you connect um, penit you know, penitence, first of all, and suffering to St. To Patrick, the saint himself. I really like that because, you know, as, as we know, you know, a lot of St. Patrick, St. Patrick is an Irish. St. <laughs> Patrick was a Roman. And, um, and, and, he, and he was uh, captured by, you know, he was captured by slavers and he was enslaved and then returned to evangelize them once he was a, uh, once he was a bishop. So uh, it's just really interesting to see to, to see this the, the suffering that he had the suffering that he had to go through, and then connecting that even to the Irish immigrants in New York. I actually really I, that was probably my favorite part of the thing, part of your entire talk was that you you showed that the spirit of St. Patrick made it made it all the way to the United States, and the corned beef tradition actually might be part of that tradition, but. At the end of the day, if it does fall on a Friday, like you were saying yeah. before, that means that you need to continue that tradition and give up something, which might be that corned beef. Yeah, and I think as well, you know, there's another thing. St. Patrick's Day always falling in Lent. And obviously people give up different things for Lent. You know, some people might say, well, I'm not going to drink alcohol for Lent. I'm not going to have coffee or, you know, what have you. Um, but the, the, the idea of some major feast in Lent that is not a solemnity, that the church hasn't seen fit to raise to the level of a solemnity uh, universally, uh, to, to turn that into some great feast, even if we want to say this is a sober Catholic feast, so we're not going to be going out and getting, you know, absolutely plastered and drunk and so forth. But obviously that is a thing yes. that, as I mentioned, that the secular culture has kind of taken St. Patrick and turned him almost like into the patron saint of vomiting your guts out behind uh, O'Halligan's bar or something like that. Um, but I think, you know, that there is a thing to say, if, we, if we're going to celebrate St. Patrick, we should be celebrating him in, in a sober manner. And it falls in Lent, and there is a penitential element to that. Now, obviously, there's, there's always a Sunday falling near St. Patrick's. Then, you know what? P bust out the Guinness, bust out the uh, corned beef and cabbage, bust out the soda bread, have a great, uh, you know, St. Patrick's Day. But uh, really, I think, yeah. I think more importantly, uh, honestly, on that note, uh, you know, th this, is, this is also a time to, to follow St. Patrick's example on fighting for the faith. 
You know what I mean? Fighting for the faith. I mean, St. Patrick went toe to toe with the with the Druids. He drove the snakes out of Ireland. You know, and he did that, and he did that all as a you know as a uh, as, as a reservoir of the, of, of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. as a reservoir of grace. And he and he was able he was able to do that. He was a fighter. He wasn't just a he he wasn't just somebody who suffered. He's somebody who ran to the suffering because he knew that that suffering was God's was God's will. So, I mean, it, what a great Lenten message, I think, to, to all the Catholics out there who are going to be, you know, sitting at dinner tables around Easter time. You're going to be sitting or, sitting all around their family members who are more secular, who you don't really care that much about the faith. Now's the time to fight. Drive the snakes out of your family's minds. Drive the snakes, you know, out of out of all of these things and, and be a ambassador for the Catholic faith. A yeah. good one, a no. genuine one. Absolutely. And I think it's wonderful to use the phrase reservoir of grace there because that's been a, a topic that's been discussed. So if we imagine grace as water, we can talk about this idea of channels of grace through which the grace flows, like water would throw, flow through a pipe. Or then you've got the idea of a reservoir of grace, which is when it's a large cistern filled up with grace and the grace spills over uh, that way. Now, obviously you think, oh, well, you know, if you're a channel of grace, surely that's wonderful. Well, here's some, here's some guys who are channels of grace. Uh, Pontius Pilate was a channel of grace. The, the grace uh, of uh, the crucifixion flowed through Pilate uh, and into the crucifixion itself, but it didn't, it didn't leave anything in Pilate. Uh, Judas was a channel of grace. The, the, again, the grace of the crucifixion flowed through him. It's very important there to, to be talking about, like, be a reservoir of grace, especially when we talk about, like, driving the snakes out. Obviously, you know, I think in reality, uh, there's a lot of people who will say that there were, there were never any snakes in Ireland, like actual real snakes. They just never got there because apparently snakes aren't that good at swimming. But the, uh, the issue is the driving the snakes out of Ireland is driving the evil of the Druids, of paganism, of that human sacrifice out of Ireland. But driving the snakes out of yourself, it's your weaknesses, your failings, your softness, your unwillingness to embrace the cross. And that is where we need to start if we want to be a reservoir of grace. We have to drive all that sin out so that we can become a reservoir of grace and then, then we can flow uh, else, elsewhere uh, on that one. Anyway, Joe, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, don't forget that Joe has his show, Red Top Report, which is on two, three times a week and always fun and entertaining, particularly popular, I believe, among the Ute, uh, as they are referred to today, the Utes, the young persons. Um, and don't forget that uh, Hardline is a show right now that is free to watch. You can watch this without a subscription, without anything else, but starting in April, starting in April, Hardline is going to be premium along with Forward Boldly and The Michael Voris Show. That will be premium. So please sign up for a premium subscription right now so that you are ready when these shows go premium in April. We will be bringing new shows online uh, in April and shortly afterwards. I've already mentioned the download. There are other shows planned. But these three shows, Hardline, Forward Boldly, and The Michael Voris Show, will be going premium starting in April. So you need to sign up for a subscription to watch them. Anyway, now it is time to plug in the satellite to connect to the digital superhighway to speak to our Rome correspondent, Jules Gomesh, all the way over in the Vatican City to have a bit of a gentleman's chat with him about what's going on in Rome. So Jules, what is happening there over in the old world, as they used to call it? I hear there's some sad news out of merry old England. Uh, Simon, uh, the news from England is absolutely dreadful. Uh, it is Orwell's 1984 come alive. Uh, the British Parliament has just passed a draconian law uh, on uh, Tuesday, and this will actually ban people. It will criminalize silent prayer outside abortion mills. Now, what's shameful about it is that uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, that great conservative Catholic, you know, uh, tough, if we can use that <laughs> word. Uh, uh, he was once my hero, and, uh, you know, he was so bold when it came to abortion. He's a faithful Catholic who goes to the Latin Mass. 
I didn't see him in the House of Commons at all. And there were very few parliamentarians debating, but then they all came in at the last moment to vote. Uh, and uh, the, the, the debate was fierce and some very good points were made both by a couple of Catholic and a couple of evangelical Christians and one even Ian Paisley, not the old Ian Paisley, oh, no. his son, brought up the topic of, uh, you know, brought up uh, the prophet Daniel uh, daring to defy the state and pray when he was forbidden to pray. So that, that's very, that's absolutely, you know, uh, I mean, it has left me utterly shocked, Simon. Yeah, it's it's absolutely terrible. I mean, I've been kind of following it there. And obviously, you know, as you say, Rhys Mogg, you know, a great, you know, I, I'm not sure you can use the word tough. I think that's, that, that's our word. That's our word, Jules. Uh, that's but... <laughs> But uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, of course, a great champion of the pro-life cause, but apparently, you know, silent, didn't bother turning up for the debate, uh, going to what you just said. Uh, I was actually very surprised by Ian Paisley Jr. actually coming out with regard to this, because obviously we all know that this law is going to be brought against Catholics in the main. That's they're the people driving the pro-life community yes. there. It's going to be brought against Catholics in the main. And of course, Ian Paisley Jr.'s father was the the Reverend Ian Paisley uh, of of happy memory, let's say. Uh, mm. But he was an ardent anti-Catholic, extraordinarily bigoted against Catholics. So it's actually kind of somewhat encouraging, maybe a silver lining in the cloud to see uh, the young Ian Paisley actually there coming out and uh, arguing against the law that's going to be used to persecute Catholics. I'm not sure what his father would be saying to that. <laughs> well, but the, the encouraging news is that I was talking to Isabel Vaughan Spruce, who is the Catholic pro-lifer who has been arrested a second time this week? And I had a lovely chat with her on the phone. She's, you know, she's a, a you know, real star in this whole thing. I think the bravest lady in England today. And uh, she was telling me what encourages her is that she's had support from atheists, evangelicals, and and Catholics. Uh, because all of them see this as, uh, uh, you know, thought crime, a well, law that is. now introduces thought crime. So, um, you know, it's time for people of goodwill to cross denominational and religious differences and unite in what we, we have defined earlier. I think you said it, Simon, in much better language. You said you called it a healthy ecumenism or an ecumenism of goodwill, if I remember. Yes, I think that is. And obviously, you know, as well, we, we've got this ridiculous situation there where they're, they're actually uh, saying that this particular act is a crime, but the only evidence that can be brought against you is your own evidence. You have to, in order to be convicted of it, you would have to testify against yourself. Uh, so, it's, yeah. so it's completely ridiculous. I, I, this this seems to me that that it just doesn't pass some sort of judicial smell test. It sounds to me like the law lords would be just sitting there and just being completely uh, amazed that that this would even be, be passed as a law. That it seems to be almost completely unenforceable. Uh, you know, I mean, one exactly. imagines you know ridiculous scenarios. What happens if some satanist decides to go there and says that he is silently praying? in order for yeah. abortion to continue. What about that? Yeah. What what happens sure. there? You know, it's it's this these yeah. bizarre things. I actually joked that what you do is you stand there, wait for the police officers to come, and then you <coughs> you sneeze, and when one of them says, bless you, you arrest them as a citizen's arrest. But, you know, it, it, I mean, these ridiculous scenarios to be, uh, you know, actually sort of considering this. But I just suppose it, it shows where the, uh, the, the, the crazy left is today. Um, and on the subject of the crazy left, we had some crazy left I think, in the Vatican, who managed to glue themselves to a statue uh, of, of, of a hero of the Trojan War or something like that. This, well, this, that sounds interesting. You know, that's made my day, Simon. You know, the news tends to be quite depressing, but this was kind of, you know, on the lighter side. And these two uh, uh, vandals, if I can call them that, Guido Viero and Esther Goffi, they got into the Vatican Museums in October last year and glued themselves uh, very symbolically to a statue of uh, a Lao Kun, yes. who was a Trojan priest. And when asked why they did that, they said, well, you know, this guy actually warned uh, his uh, compatriots not to let the Trojan horse in. Um, and uh, they rebuffed him, they let uh, it in, and you know what happened, uh, Troy fell as a result of that. 
But uh, the, the gods were very angry, the Greek gods, because they had it all planned out. And they sent two giant serpents, and the giant serpents, you know, strangled poor Lao Kun and his two sons. Mm -hmm. Now, these climate change activists were saying, uh, just like Lao Kun, we are here prophetically warning you that the end of the world is nigh if you do not repent of your use of fossil fuels. But they also say uh, Pope Francis should be ashamed, you know, he is in threatening to throw us in jail for three years. Now, he is a big climate change, uh, you know, uh, activist, uh, and the world listens to him. So why is he doing this to us? And strangely, the Vatican has uh, is telling them that the, the damage they caused to Lao Kun's culture costs about 15,000 euros to fix. But I spoke to a source of mine in the Vatican museums today, and this person told me that this figure has been grossly exaggerated because there was almost no, virtually no damage done to the statue at all. Oh, so. well, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, personally, speaking personally, any of these numpties who are going around gluing themselves to statues, throwing paint on, uh, uh, you know, classical paintings and so forth, uh, gluing themselves to the road, hurling soup uh, over various places and all this kind of stuff. Oh, those, those people just need to be locked away. Perhaps they don't need to be locked away in jail. Yeah. Perhaps they just need to be put away in the funny farm. But that's, that's just me, and I wouldn't insist on it. I do, however, think it's ridiculously ironic that a bunch of climate change activists are sitting here and using the figure of Lao Kuhn, who was, of course, war against the Trojan horse, whereas the climate change activists are using their Trojan horse of environmental concerns to bring in anti-life policies and uh, communism and all this sort of stuff. It just seems terribly, terribly ironic and a little bit ridiculous. Anyway, yeah. I, I, I wish Pope Francis every success in, in throwing these numpties into jail. Anyway, I think we've probably just got time for one more story, Jules, and I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty sad one. All of these suicides of nuns in India are very distressing uh, figure uh, when looked at over the last few years. Well, Simon, there's almost one nun committing suicide every year in India. And the reason she's doing it is most likely because uh, there's a, uh, there are predator priests abusing nuns on an industrial scale. Two nuns have already published books uh, and blown the whistle on this. Now, uh, they do admit that there are nuns who also, you know, are happy to have uh, consensual relationships with priests, uh, either for pleasure or for furthering their own uh, climb up the greasy pole of the Catholic hierarchy. But uh, the problem is very serious, and the methods of suicide are gruesome and grotesque. About seven nuns have hanged themselves from the, the ceiling fans, about t nine nuns have thrown themselves into wells in the convent or water tanks in the convent. One slit her wrists and jumped into the well. One was found dead on the railway tracks and uh, one was murdered by a priest and a nun acting in collaboration with each other. So uh, I wrote to the uh, Religious Conference of India who heads up you know, the, the Catholic religious there and they were asked last year by 89 nuns to conduct an investigation. Nothing has been done so far, and they didn't respond to me. Wow, wow. Well, you know, I think, I think obviously this, uh, the, the response of these victims to uh, their trauma, their abuse, is, you know, obviously tragic, it's horrible, it's in some way understandable that these people, uh, these nuns, have been abused and they see that, that nothing happens to address it mm -hmm. and what what can they possibly do? What can they possibly do to address it? That is why, Jules, we are so grateful to be having you uh, as our correspondent, not just for Rome and the Vatican, but really for, as I said, the whole of the old world. You're going all the way, uh, you know, from the Scepter Dial all the way over to the Indian subcontinent and so forth. We'll have to see if we can get you to cover some stories in Mongolia or Japan or something like that, just so you can cover the whole of the continent. You even cover things in Africa, Jules, and it's always wonderful. This is why it's so wonderful to have you bringing these stories to
to the English media, bringing uh, English speaking media, bringing these stories to our viewers here. We're so very grateful to have you. For everyone watching at home, remember that Jules brings you all of these stories. It's not just Rome, it's a ton of other stuff as well that Jules brings you. Please, if you can support us with your donations, those go towards helping us have Jules's uh, bureau there in Rome to bring you these stories. So please do consider a donation. Jules, as always, a pleasure to talk to you, even when the news is sad. But sometimes the news is hilarious, like people gluing themselves to a statue and Pope Francis not being happy about it. Jules, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Simon. The pleasure is all mine. Always wonderful to talk to Jules. Don't forget this show and uh, Forward Boldly and The Michael Voris Show will be going premium starting in April. So please sign up for a premium subscription if you haven't already so that you continue to watch these great shows. And don't forget, this is Lent. And so even when there are times when there's a way to make it easier, a way to make it softer, maybe there's a way to have a bit of a feast in the middle of all this penance, remember, you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. I'm Simon Rafe. And I've taken the hard line. <laughs>